The remote and rugged nature of the Claybury River Canyon evokes a timeless rhythm reflected in the daily life of the first people who called it home. To the central Sierra Miwok, the Claybury River was both home and travel way. Like the deer, the Miwok moved with the seasons. When the warmth of spring traveled up the Sierra Gradient, the people would follow the cycle of new plant growth, dispersing themselves up the Claybury River and its many tributaries to gather the first greens, collect last year's growth of straight shoots for basket weaving, gather fresh medicines, hunt, fish, and visit with neighboring bands. By midsummer, the Miwok had reached their summer camps in Bell Meadow and other destinations in the Clavy Headwaters. Here, they traded acorns and other resources for obsidian quarried by the Paiute from volcanic deposits on the east side of the Sierra. As the days grew short and the aspens began to turn, the Miwok began moving down the tributaries, gathering and caching acorns as they returned to places below snow line where canyon walls still radiated their warmth. The Clavy River echoes with these ancient migration patterns that still can be traced by deer herds moving through the canyon. To the Miwok, their home and all that sustained them was sacred. The people had a remarkable understanding of water, fire, geology, pharmacology, entomology, and plant and animal behavior. With this understanding came a profound respect for nature that was woven into their culture and language. And with this respect, came the belief that the birds were their brethren, and even the smallest insect had its job. The people's journey throughout the Clavy watershed has left its signature on the rocks beside its waters. Nowhere is the rhythm of the seasons so silently conveyed but on the faces of bedrock milling stations. Here on these granite faces, generations of mothers, daughters, and grandmothers rhythmically pounded acorns creating hundreds of conical mortar holes in the process. The sounds of pounding must have permeated the air. This was the cultural heartbeat of the first people who lived along the Clavy that has carried forward within the Miwok people today. Theirs is a living legacy that is not separate from the natural world, but is the landscape itself. The legacy on the land, left by non-Indigenous people, bears the marks of both resource stewardship and extraction. The richness of the Clavy's natural resources brought waves of industries such as grazing, mining, logging, and 100 years of Forest Service administration that have shaped the land over time. The 1848 gold rush heralded a new way of looking at the Sierra Mountains, forever changing their course. These newcomers saw the land through the eyes of ambition and the dreams of striking it rich. The idea of exploiting something until it panned out was foreign to the aboriginal way of life. Yet, it was precisely because of thousands of years of native stewardship, pruning, digging, and human-ignited fires that the newcomers were able to profit. Within a few decades, gold mining gave way to the green gold of the timber industry, the Clavy River watershed contained thousands of acres of sugar pine, cedar, douglas fir, and pine. In 1899, the Westside Flume and Lumber Company was established by William H. Crocker, the son of Charles Crocker of the Big Four and Central Pacific Railroad fame. Both William and his cousin Henry Crocker had timber holdings and wasted no time laying down tracks into the Clavy territory. Over the years, the narrow gauge track grew into 75 miles of main line and some 250 miles of spur track that reached lumber camps at various locations within the company's 60,000 acres of virgin timber holdings. For 60 years, the narrow gauge trains fed the lumber mills of Tuolumne. Today, one can only imagine the sounds, hustle and toil of camp life at places called Reynolds Camp and Camp Clavy. Overgrown rail beds still wind past rusting steam donkey hulks or lead into features such as the Borland Trestle, icon of the narrow gauge with its immense timbers and graceful curve across Borland Creek. Long before the lower reaches of the Clavy were opened up for logging, 
Its alpine meadows were a mainstay for summer grazing, which the foothill ranchers still depend on today. As a newcomer on the scene in 1896, one of the first acts of stewardship the National Forest Service grappled with was the range wars between sheep herders and cattle grazing. The forest concluded that the sheep had to go. This decision reflected the father of the Forest Service, Gifford Pinchot's creed, the greatest use for the greatest good for the long run. Through time, Pinchot's creed has become more and more encumbered and has even changed course as new science, such as the benefits from fire, comes to light. In the millennia of human interaction within the Clavy River watershed, the last 150 years has tested the resiliency of the landscape. The historical impacts from logging, mining, grazing, and Forest Service administration continue to have a profound influence on the soil, water, wildlife, and ecological balance of each life zone. But this is only part of its history. The inheritance of the clavy is an underlying legacy of thousands of years of sustainability and balance. It is through awareness and collaborative efforts that this balance can be put into practice. The resiliency of a landscape means that the impacts to the land, water, soil, vegetation, and wildlife, whether from catastrophic fire or human uses, do not outpace the self-balancing processes of nature. The kinds of human uses and how much use the land can handle are questions that the CREP Collaborative hopes to answer through the assessment process. Like the clavy, whose sum is greater than its parts, the strength of a common vision for enjoying and sustaining the clavy's incredible beauty and diversity is greater than any individual effort. The legacy of the Clavy River watershed includes both humans and nature. As practiced by the first stewards of these Sierra streams, there is again the need to find harmony. Acting together, we can steer a healthy course between our right to enjoy and use its resources and our responsibility to protect and bequeath these resources to future generations.